This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm David McDonald. I'm Sam Mercier's. And I'm Nate Blyton. And joining us this week is the Executive Artistic Director of Ensemble for the Romantic Century. And I could go on and on trying to describe that to you, but it's a new type of uh, concert presentation that I think it's best left up to Eve to describe to you. Eve, welcome to the show. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. Awesome. Um, so I've watched some of your stuff online, um, but once again, I don't think I'm really qualified to describe it. So uh, for someone, assume that someone knows nothing about what this is. Tell us what uh, Ensemble for the Romantic Century is and what your programs do and what it's like. Well, first, I'd like to say that our general mission is the following. Our mission is to time travel. When you go to one of our concerts, we want you to feel that you've traveled in time. You're not only hearing the music, but you're living the life of those times. You're experiencing the history. We have actors and musicians on stage. The scripts are built uh, from primary source material, memoirs, biographies, literature. So you're hearing the real words of composers, authors, painters, and the music is intertwined. Um, and the concert length of the music is the same as a concert, but it's like being in a play with a concert embedded in it, all interwoven very beautifully and balanced. And we like to think and have been told very gripping, very compelling, because you're not just listening to music, you're, you're being jettisoned into the world of the composer or of the figure that we are exploring. Yeah, that, uh, I thought it was it's, very interesting. Go ahead. It's fully costumed. We have a lighting designer, a full team. We have a production designer. Um, and I like to think it's an experience where you can go out of your own body and suspend for two hours um, the same way when you go to the movies, where you can enjoy a concert as if you were in a movie. Right. Um, I'm a big fan of two things that you got going on here. I love multimedia presentations, and uh, there's – Seems like in every show, or at least every show I saw a picture or saw a brief video of, there's some kind of projected screen activity going on. And it's also a hybrid sort of between, as you said, a music concert and a theatrical presentation, which is right. very intriguing to me. Um, I also think that the, um, the name of the group may be a little bit misleading, Ensemble for the Romantic Century, because if you look at some of the shows, like there's a show about Peggy Guggenheim. Yes. Yes. Um, so the, the, the subjects of your um, presentation or uh, the, the, the uh, shows are not always from the what we think of as, quote, the romantic period in music. Um, well, the romantic period is a very ambiguous term. Um, in fact, historians can't exactly agree when it began or ended. We do like to think of ourselves as primarily concentrating on the romantic century. But when is that? We consider it from late Mozart, and it going, it in some cases, Rachmaninoff writing into the 1940s. But it also represents to us um, the imagination of the 19th century, where they had no fears of having recitations. Um, also, they would have tableau vivant, for example, in the Mendelssohn household. Between um, readings of Beethoven's string quartets, they'd read poetry, dress up in costumes, have tableau vivant. Uh, um, read literature, everything was connected. So we like to think we have that romantic spirit of experimentation that people don't always know about. The concert format was not always the way we think of with a recital and the audience far away. There were many other ways to present music. So we like to think we're in that spirit of, of experimentation, basically. Well, that's very interesting, and actually, as we get into one of the news stories we're going to cover later, I think we'll get back to that idea of, of concerts not being what people – have not always been what people expect. Um, <clears throat> so you've been going on doing this for 12 seasons now. 13th um, season. We're in our 13th thir season. In your 13th season. So yes. it's a, obviously a collaboration between – theater professionals, and music professionals. Yes. So where does the music come from and where does the theater aspect come from? And I'm really interested in what the collaborative part of that and putting the show together is. Well, we have a really cohesive team. We've all been together for the whole, the whole time together, and we, 
We are very good friends and we have dinners together and the collaborations on a very friendly level. And this is where it begins. We have two people who write scripts. I write scripts and our musicologist, James Mello, writes scripts. I've written about 25 that have been produced. So the script is really being written by a musician. When I write a script, I um, do not write a theatrical script and then insert music. I feel and develop the whole thing simultaneously. I feel, for example, when we did Anna Akhmatova uh, meeting Isaiah Berlin, we did a production about Anna Akhmatova, the Russian poet. I just felt that we needed a ballet of the KBG in the beginning, so I used a Shostakovich waltz, and they were dusting Stalin and doing ballet flips with, uh, in KBG uniform. And then there was a scene, and then because of the last line where they said, in Russia, we even kill for poetry, I, I felt that it had to be Shostakovich. So it's not music inserted. It's, it's all simultaneous, a feeling of where the music belongs, what the context is, what the music is saying. For many musicians, I can speak for myself, but I know many who feel this way. Say you're listening to Beethoven. We feel he's speaking to us. I can almost feel I'm being spoken to, some kind of a narrative. That narrative is so clear to me that I'm completely engrossed when I listen. But it's not always apparent to all people. And so finding that narrative, those connections that are really already there is, is a job for a musician. Our, we, our script writers are musicians. Once a script has been written and gone through an editorial process, we then have team meetings and the director, the lighting designer, and the production designer are all there, and they hear the author talk about what they feel about this feels like it should be a blue color, or I feel that the actors should be doing this. Then it's handed over to the experts, and it's delegated, and then they have the provenance of they then take it to the next level. I don't tell the lighting designer what to do. When we did a production on Beethoven, um, it was about the creation of Fidelio, and it was about his search for love. I said to the production designer, it really feels like everyone should be in white. It feels like that to me. He's searching for a bride. She, well, she put all the female characters in, in uh, wedding gowns. It was mm. fabulous because it was this search for his ideal love, which is also true in Fidelio, and which he never found in real life, but in um, Fidelio he finds the ideal love. That was the juxtaposition. But so all this is communicated, but there's a lot of trust on the in the team. So once the writer communicates it, the other artists then develop it in their own um, artistic ways. And then there are checks and balances as well. So the music content of the shows, is any of it originally composed music, or is it all just sort of rearranged music of the past? It's all pre-existing music which gives us the benefit of having masterpieces. We like to combine really well-known masterpieces with very obscure music that, that people have never heard and put it more into context. Sometimes even music that isn't that good, like compositions by Nietzsche. When we did his uh, a production about him, we, we had him embedded in there. And of course, his music was not very good, but it's very interesting to hear it in the context of the other composers. And... Um, sometimes lesser-known composers. When, when we did Jules Verne, we used Chaminade and Chausson. It was sort of the male-female parallel to Jules Verne and Nellie Bly. They took on a characters of their own. And I don't think people generally have heard much Chaminade. So we will use pre-existing masterpieces with more obscure works. When we did the Peggy Guggenheim, we did have in mind to commission a work because Peggy would have done it, but we mm -hmm. didn't have the funds at that moment. We do hope to do that and we do have a place for commissioning yes in our plans well in the future when you get around to commissioning a piece let us know because we will push it for you Wonderful. you were you were officially now a friend of the show and you get free plugging rights henceforth on the show how does uh, <laughs> i'm curious how the the idea of commissioning a work fits in with your mission of of the romantic century and you you talked about kind of the the idea of traveling back in time to the, the romantic period, however you define that. How does the idea of commissioning a new work fit in with that vision of, of your project? 
Well, first of all, it would depend on the context. In the example of Peggy Guggenheim, she, would, had, she did commission musical works. She knew Yoko Ono, by the way, uh, John Cage. She had an album of some of her commissioned works. She was very connected to composers. So even by historically looking back on Peggy Guggenheim, one would maybe in the spirit of Peggy Guggenheim then commission a work as she would have done. Um, and uh, in, the, in that case, there were, in that show, there were 36 pieces of chamber music. And people don't think of her as connected to music, but the whole milieu is connected to composers, artists, and writers. It's very rarely separated. There's always a connection. And again, it's the spirit of the Romantic century. And that's a very creative, um, generative spirit that is new, old. The Romantic century loved to look back at the Middle Ages and... Um, there was a propensity for looking backward in time and romanticizing the past, but also creating new and exciting works. So I don't really see it as a conflict. We're not a museum piece. We're a creative um, group, and it's the spirit of the romantic century we're carrying forward. And to get to the conversation, which we'll get to later, about classical music being dead, it's so far from dead. There's there's creativity, um oozing out all over the scene if you look closely. This is part of what I was wondering. With uh, So I could see this kind of presentation giving new life to any kind of music. And I was wondering, uh, yes. in, through doing this kind of uh, collaboration with uh, different kinds of artists, like theater people, scenic designers, and, and ballet, <laughs> ballet, yes, ballet dancers. Ballet is next production. Um, like even in Beethoven, do you do you find yourself finding new things in the music through doing it or exploring it in this context with all these different kinds of art? Well, for example, in our the Beethoven production, I have on my agenda to write a Beethoven trilogy. I have other Beethoven projects in mind. The fact of juxtaposing the solo music with songs that people knew very little about was so interesting because by looking at the texts of composers, the song texts, you often get a little glimpse into their souls. You get to see what kind of texts are they interested in. In the case of Beethoven, there are a lot of love songs. Um, there's even an early song that has, you, you really can hear the Ninth Symphony chorale theme in it. You hear the strands of things that later appear in sonatas. And in a way, it gives text um, in a very loose sense, to instrumental music, because you, again, you see what a composer is interested in when you see the text that they choose. So I think that has, gave me insight. And when you, compa when you compare Fidelio, those texts, and that search for the ideal woman, and then you listen again to the Moonlight Sonata, which is dedicated to a woman that rejected him, it, mm -hmm. it changes the whole situation. You see his psychological makeup and I think it deepens one's uh, reaction and feeling, and that's what we want to do in our performances. Deep, deepen the audience's feeling of connection psychologically to these, the composers, but also to their subject matter. And it sounds like you're also able to put on quite a show. Just <laughs> yeah, it's fun, and it's not yeah. didactic. It's, like, it's really fun. I often see people crying and weeping. Um, I had for the Tchaikovsky show that's coming up, and we did it in the in, with Shakespeare and Company this summer. There were I saw uh, one person go to the parking lot intermission and just break down weeping because he was a gay man who had lived his life sort of a double life, finally come out and to relive the Tchaikovsky story with all his struggles was just very emotional for him and for many people actually. Well, let's, let's dig into that now. The show you have coming up is about Tchaikovsky. So why don't you tell us about that and when it's going to premiere? Okay. That show is going to be at BAM, March 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, and 9th. There will be two shows on the 8th. And it's at the Fisher Fishman Space, which is a small theater, 200-plus seats. It's another thing that we really love is not too big of a space. We believe music has a lot more impact in the right space. Let's not even define it as must be small, must be large. The right space. And before I go on with this, I just want to go backtrack for one more minute about commission things, just for a minute. I'm, I'm ha in the works. I have a plan for a piece for next year. I'm not going to divulge it at the moment. That's going to even include original rap music. 
So we can really integrate and juxtapose a classical hip hop, rap, um, 12 tone, anything, because as you had said before, this would work with any form of music and theater. It, it just has to be done well. And with the subject matter at hand, it has to make sense. So anyway, back to Tchaikovsky. So we're doing it at BAM, and the theater is only about 200 seats. Uh, so it, you know, we expect tickets will be gone. <laughs> and we we like we committed to small spaces because it's there's more impact. I sometimes feel in concerts if I'm too far away, I can't hear it, I can't feel it. And one of the things about chamber music, which I'm sure most of your Listeners know it's musique de chambre, which means music for a room. So now 200-seat theater is not a room, but with lighting, you can feel like you're in a room. It can feel pretty close. And we have given concerts in salons and in palazzi and in beautiful spaces because people need to be physically closer and feel closer. And I think that's one of the problems with the old-fashioned concert scene the detach between audience and um, the performers of, of actual distance. So we're going to be at BAM, and it's called Tchaikovsky, None But the Lonely Heart. We have two actors. We have a violinist, cellist, pianist. I'm playing. I'm a pianist. And we have a dancer from ABT and a tenor, fabulous tenor. And uh, the um, production is about Tchaikovsky's very odd relationship with his patroness, Madame Nadezhda von Meck. Now, I don't know how many of you know that story, but it's fabulous because the basis of the story is they decided never to meet in order to have an ideal relationship. So what could be more modern than that? It could be a Facebook relation, an email. It could be you've got mail. They decided never, ever, ever to meet and they carried on with 1,200 letters at least, very intimate letters. And not only that, they would vacation together on her estate, but make sure never to meet by sending out schedules to one another to detail where they were so they wouldn't bump into each other. And she would even go into his house when she knew he was out, arrange his cigars, leave him the tea he wanted, his newspapers, and make sure she was gone. They only met once by accident. They bumped into one another passing in carriages on the road on her estate, and they were so startled and shocked that they didn't even uh, acknowledge each other. And this was a very, very intimate relationship, psychologically intimate, and that is the basis of this show. But through it, you're going to find out all about the inner life of Tchaikovsky, hear fabulous music, his entire a minor trio, which in itself is a story about that trio. That's a that's a whole story. It's a it's a tribute to another composer after his death, Rubinstein. And you will hear about Tchaikovsky's attempt to become straight. Of course, they didn't have the words gay and straight in those days. Mm -hmm. um, his marriage to, as he said, I will get married to anyone to keep the people from gossiping. Right. And so on. And his relationship with Nadezhda von Meck, you'll find out about what happened with Tchaikovsky's mother, which has a lot to do with von Meck psychologically. And you will have uh, original choreography. Um, I'm going to be playing a Pletnev transcription from the Nutcracker Suite. And there will be a violin scherzo, a cello nocturne, the entire trio and Tchaikovsky songs, which are magnificent. And um, it's the intermingling of all these factors with gorgeous costumes and lighting that will transport you to his inner world and outer world. You know, it's interesting to hear you talk about uh, these, these presentations because you're talking about them in a way that makes them feel very relevant to life in the United States in 2014, even though the source material is about as distant from that as it could be. Um, but you, the themes that you're talking about are just as relevant now as they, they were at any time. And I think that's an interesting way maybe 
to get into this uh, Mark Van Honacher uh, slate piece about cl- classical music in America being dead is that you, in the way that you're describing it, make this content feel very relevant. And while the the play, essentially, the, the, the presentation, I don't know if you want to call it a play, but the, the music drama thing. We, we call it a theatrical concert. A theatrical concert okay. that you're presenting is a new and original work um, that draws upon a lot of other works. Yes. Um, and I think that's a really interesting way to make music and other content that I think is very easily otherwise thought of as not particularly relevant uh, to us today to make it very relevant. And I, I, do you, do you deliberately um, try to uh, draw those connections for your audience or are you simply presenting this work and, and uh, letting those connections be apparent? Well, I sometimes it's a little of each. I don't choose topics in a gimmicky way so that they're relevant. I choose what I feel passionate about. I only write what I am interested in. I think that the human drama through all ages is always relevant if you can get to the heart of the matter. Um, Here's a man who was basically abandoned by his mother, who then, in a kind of a transference sort of way, Um, has a relationship with someone he never meets who becomes his, quote, invisible angel. And through that relationship, almost a psychological transference can can, uh, unload a lot of his grief and his conflicts. In this script, there also are letters to his brother, Modest Tchaikovsky, who is also gay. And they're very, very explicit letters. And um, Tchaikovsky was tormented about being homosexual, and he was also tormented about gambling. He had what he called his two vices. He called one X and one Y, and in his diary he would write, I'm tormented today by X, but Y is tormenting me also. Um, He tried to fight his nature because it wasn't accepted, and I think that's completely relevant. There's nothing more relevant than this, in fact, because... Unfortunately, in Russia today, um, there are anti-gay laws that have just been put into effect very recently. And not only, not only that, the culture minister in Russia a few months ago came out to say Tchaikovsky wasn't even gay. <laughs> you know that? And a, a major bi- biopic came out from Russia in which he was seen as straight. Now, nothing could be further from the truth. Nothing is easier to find out than by reading his letters to his brother. They're so explicit. And um, unfortunately, there's still all this bigotry and in some countries punishable by the death penalty. So uh, certainly being homosexual is relevant and struggling in a society that has not accepted it. That is very relevant. But also loss of a parent and the the need to to find... um, you know, peace with the death of a parent is also part of this, and it's a universal theme. So that is also very relevant. And the the sublimation of all this grief and difficulty in life into art is why we have art, because we can relive this grief, this drama, but in a way we rise above it and we transcend it. And we, in, in the end, his story is very important because he left us such beautiful music and it was through his pain that he left us this music. And the other backstory is a person like Nadezhda von Meck, she supported Tchaikovsky for 13 years solid so he did not have to teach. She recognized his talent early. If she had not done that, we may not have had half the masterpieces of Tchaikovsky we have today. So it's also a celebration and recognition of patronage that if we value art, we will also patronize it and that a patron is not just somebody to collect money from, but, but an ally, a person who has deep understanding of what you do. And I, I feel this is also an homage to our patrons and, um, the script is dedicated to one of our major patrons, in fact, because of her love and dedication and appreciation of what we're doing. And um, 
in, at this time in Russia, and I believe in Europe, patronage, a patron was regarded on the same level as an artist, as an artist themselves, because they, had, they were the taste makers. They had the taste to know what was good. So they were highly respected for their choices. And this is, so there's so many relevant issues. It's, it's completely relevant. And, and who doesn't love this music? It's absolutely exquisite. I mean, people flock to the Nutcracker they love the symphonies, and um, I don't think you'll find too many people who don't like Tchaikovsky. So I think it brings beauty into one's life through pain, basically, through his pain. Well, it certainly gives it a, uh, makes it seem salient to things going on now. I would, don't want to say that it's, that you are lucky that Russia is being so draconian about <laughs> homosexuality, but it's certain serendipitous, because one has to assume this show has been in plans for quite some time with the, the moves by Russian authorities only taking place fairly recently, should be noted that the mayor of Sochi actually said, oh, we don't have any gay people in Sochi. Right, amazing. And, yeah. <laughs> We're actually having an entire uh, tribute to gay rights this year. And so our next production is The Trial of Oscar Wilde. And if oh. you know about that, he was one of the most major intellectual cultural figures. He was married, had children. But he was found to have had a uh, homosexual relationship. He was shackled in public, imprisoned, had a trial, imprisoned and beaten horrendously in, in prison, apparently died afterwards. Not, not much. He didn't live much longer because of his injuries. He had probably some brain damage from the beatings. And this, was, this would be like our most major playwright, let's say, or poet, who would have been shackled and in prison, well, this could happen in Russia right now, or Uganda, or, in other words, um, we are paying tribute all year to gay rights. Yes. Well, I wonder. I wonder if uh, you don't have to give anything away about the, the plot of your pre of your theatrical concert if you don't choose. But I was wondering if you're familiar with the Tchaikovsky biography that came out in 1996 by Anthony Holden that basically puts forth the idea that Tchaikovsky didn't die of uh, by drinking contaminated water the way it's properly told, that he intentionally basically committed suicide because he was going to be outed publicly. Um, well, actually, there's a lot of speculation, and I have to say scholars aren't sure. They aren't sure. It's one thing is for certain. It, psychologically, his mother died of cholera. It was one of the most traumatic events of his life. When he was dying, he even said, I'm going to die like my mother. Mm -hmm. There was a cholera epidemic. He, dr he drank carelessly contaminated water. Who would do that? And right after his latest symphony had been premiered to huge uh, accolades and, and great success, he did I mean, that. who would just pick up a, a, a contaminated water? He was an absolute hypochondriac about his health. He was so afraid to die. He was always talking about it in his letters. And he picks up this glass of contaminated water. There was a death wish, even if he didn't, if you might not call it suicide, there's something psychological there. Now, as far as him being outed, three years before his death, out of the blue, Nadezhda von Meck cut off all assistance to him. And people do... Some scholars have suggested that she was protecting him because he was about to be outed. Now, in Russia at that time, it may have been a capital offense. He may have been also involved with someone in the royal circles, uh, a, a young man. So, you know, I, we, we probably will never know if it was suicide, but I tend to think it was a kind of um, a death wish rather than a committing of suicide that he... How, it, it was beyond careless. It was something that was out of character completely. Maybe he felt like, what's the point? I'm not even going to boil this water. I'm going to just drink this contaminated water. They all knew that they had to have procedures against cholera. He would have been the most maniacal about that. So it's a very odd thing. And he died right. pretty early. Yes. Um, so anyway... Uh... This all, to me, uh, works, the whole conversation we've had so far works to refute the stipulations that were made in the last two weeks ago in the Slate piece. That Yeah, uh, why I are you spending so much time and energy on these things if classical music's dead? For, I mean, yeah, it's totally dead. dead. That's what I read. I read that in the news. You know, I don't know about this article, but I 
now have started mentoring at Juilliard, for example, and I'm mentoring a group that is going to be doing Baroque and contemporary music together with narration. There are people doing, um, of course, Matt Heimovitz started playing in grocery stores. There's subculture. There's Poisson Rouge. Um, many people are combining electronic music with things like Arvo Pert. I think there's crossover galore. I love crossover. I even was in favor of the three tenors. Sometimes my classical colleagues might say, oh, that's the dumbing down of music. No, that's the crossing over and building bridges. We're building a, one kind of bridge. Other people are building other bridges. Bring people over these bridges, everyone. Build yeah. the bridges and they will come because people need the bridges because more and more time has separated us now from the past and things that were taken for granted aren't so well known now, like the, the biographies of some of these people, the cultural context. Our bridge is through theater, but other people's bridge might be through very interesting programming that makes interconnections, video design that pulls people in visually because we're a more visual generation. I say do everything you can because music has always been creative, and then when it calcifies the creative people will invent something new. It's only the calcifiers who are saying that it's dead. The people who right. are creating new things know it's absolutely not dead. And if it isn't popping up here in America, maybe it's in Berlin. So, you know, it's, it may be dead in one spot and then it's flowering in another. It's not necessarily always going to be New York, but I think New York is a very creative location and experimenting with multimedia film is such a creative source for classical music, too. I would like to see a whole new generation of MTV classical and <laughs> someone to find a good way to present classical music in that format. Well, if, I mean, um, if I may play devil's advocate a little bit, um, I think that there is something that we need to be honest with, and that is that there there is less money going to this thing than there used to be. There's certainly less attention to classical music than there used to be. And I think it's easy to say, well, I know people, anecdotally, I know people that are successful and that are doing interesting things. But we're also, I think, building our the walls around our niche uh, higher and higher all the time as well. Um, and I don't, I don't know. I, there are certainly people that are that are trying to work against that, but at the same time, I don't think it's easy to refute that the audience for classical music, in as much as we can measure the audience for classical music, um, is getting older and smaller, and um, there there are some things that. I mean, it's it's easy to track people that go to big orchestra concerts and big institutional events. It's much harder to track people that are doing small independent things, that are doing kind of mixed uh, mixed genre things, that are working in non-traditional venues. Those are all much harder to track. Um, but I think just saying, just looking at numbers that say that the audience is is shrinking and saying well i know people that are doing exciting and interesting things is th th i mean those are talking about two different things those are but i'm not so sure we know that it's shrinking because for example look at the opera which is very inspiring what peter gelb has been doing which the with the hd i mean the audience is growing for opera around the world i think it's a fantastic venture that will spill over to all of classical music because people will see that maybe Classical chamber music concerts should be filmed and presented that way as well. Um, I also Maybe think often it's, are. it's a question of patronage again. When you had the Medicis, they decided what the music would be. When you had the church, they were the patrons. Now it's the free market. People will invent. They, there will always be music and artists. And if some things are dying out, they may have become too prehistoric and museum-like. Orchestras will have to reinvent themselves as well. There has to be a regeneration and a recreation of things. And that doesn't mean I always believe in multimedia, but it, everyone will have to figure out how to make it more relevant. And, and if you look back in history and realize that what we consider the classical concert format of a, 
an hour and 20 minute recital or an orchestra concert was never like that. They used to have four hour concerts. They would have academies. They would have all day concerts. People would be eating and drinking while they were, or there'd be home concerts. And it was always an elite thing to tell you the truth. It was never a lot, you know, the, the masses, let's call them. I think they're probably, if someone did a really mathematical study, there are more people than ever who are listening to classical music. Maybe the uh, CD industry has died, but so have the newspapers died and now everything's online. So now you have YouTube and you can listen to any historical performance you want. It's fabulous. I just think we're in the process of recreating and we will go through a metamorphosis and come out on the other side. So one thing I, that you, you said so a couple of things positive. there that I, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Are you, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, you said a couple of things there that seemed to contradict to me. You said that you want to see an MTV for classical music that, that is, yes. makes it cool for, for every, everybody, regular people. But then you just said that um, – th- I'm sorry to point at you. Like, uh, <laughs> <That's okay>. <laughs> <laughs> for the people that are not watching the video, I was pointing rudely at the camera, which is not a person. Um, but you also said that – this is not something that has been for everybody historically, that it has not been uh, kind of a... a there, there's a difference. There's a distinct difference between creating something for art and creating something for commerce. And commerce is the thing that drives so-called popular music, and art and expression is the thing that drives so-called classical well, we music or art music. Means, we have the means now to have classical music disseminated to everyone and I believe there are going to be more and more people we just have to be inventive in the ways that that is brought to people it you know through the your your podcast through uh, MTV I I envision a time where we may have hologram concerts where you're Mm -hmm. surrounded by screens I mean the the sky's the limit and the music itself is a great we have the greatest masterpieces we just have to connect people to them they're there waiting and it's, yeah, we should make it really cool. So I think the operas become very cool and younger. And one of our aims is to go younger and younger. We're aiming at the younger generation, absolutely. Not because we are against the older generation. I'm in the older generation. It's, it, we're, it's just because we want it to live. We're passing the torch down. The, the, the music is still there. That's why I feel fortunate to build these concerts around masterpieces. And I know that what I'm presenting is already great art in the music. Um, And I'm reconnecting people to it in a different way. But um, I feel only positive about the growth of classical music. It's not dying whatsoever. Only it may appear that way if an orchestra here and there is folding, but other things will spring up in its place. Well, I'd like, go ahead. Well, I just like to point out, first of all, Dave, thanks for playing the devil's advocate because normally that's my job. (laughs) <laughs> and you kind of you kind of chopped me off at the knees there. Sorry, um, I didn't know I you were planning of, to do that. I had a bunch of devil's advocate statements about the slate piece ready. Did I steal them all? No. One okay. big thing that he does mention in there, and as Anne Majette points out, it's a badly written article. And if you want a blow Absolutely. by blow account of how badly written it is, you should look at the uh, proper discord uh, proper discord blog. Um, Andy and they, Doe. It literally takes it down line by line. However, there are a few salient points. And one would be the democratization of cultural opinion. And to me, this really relates back to what you said, Eve, about how in Tchaikovsky's time, the patrons were the tastemakers. Well, the patrons still are the tastemakers, but who that patronage comes from is certainly still some rich people, but it's also becoming more and more groups of people like an example a a very physical example of that would be kickstarter in a kickstarter campaign the tastemaker is this gigantic group of crowd a crowd of people who contributed to this thing um and i think not not acknowledging that the shift of who is the tastemaker has changed from being exclusively the patrons, i.e. the rich people who have the money to contribute to this kind of stuff, to in some cases being a crowd of people, and that that's connected to journalism too, which um, the uh, proper Discord blog makes the point about 
um, that anybody can be a classical music critic now. And so it's not like the amount of classical music journalism that's going on has declined. It's probably the amount that you can look at this paper and that paper and that paper and say they have somebody on staff who does this has declined, but the number of people who are writing in a range from completely asinine to completely brilliant, of course, the number of people who are writing about this has actually grown vastly because everybody can have a blog. Yeah, Jay, Jay um, Rosen refers to them as the people formerly known as the audience. <laughs> well, I would say that, for example, our upcoming production, I do not, I, it is not dumbed down, it's elevating, but we have people coming to our concerts who have never gone to a classical music concert that love it. They leave and they say, oh, how do I get that music? Other people who are sophisticated musicians who love it. Um, there is nothing wrong, wrong with pleasing the crowd. You can elevate and please there's not, music doesn't have to be unpopular to be serious. Music has been popular. Beethoven was well-loved during his lifetime. There are many instances of composers who were appreciated when they were alive. And so I don't think there's a dichotomy or mutual exclusivity between being popular and being good. That's right, number right. one. And number two, it's just our job to keep being creative and make sure that what we love and believe in is competitive in the world. The world is about marketing now, for example. We musicians have to be advocates and marketers. We have to use the means that are out there the same way that people who sell meaningless products do. We have something great. We have something that can fill yourself with satisfaction. It's not a thing that you can buy. It's better than a thing you can buy. It's something for your, the, your whole life when you get to know a piece of music like the Tchaikovsky A minor trio. So we just have to uh, accommodate ourselves to the business aspect of things and be at peace with it. There's nothing wrong with it. We need to show people the truth, which is that these great masterpieces will give a great deal of satisfaction if people have that in their lives. So I think it's up to musicians, and people have been talking about this, and there have been many articles to be entrepreneurs these days. You know, courses are springing up all over the place. Musician is entrepreneur in all the conservatories. Musicians are going to have to create their own organizations, their own media, their own marketing, and everything is transforming. And I think it's very positive. I don't believe classical music is dead. And I think if people come to our production, they will also see that it's fun and it's moving and it's, it's like going to the movies or something. It's absolutely a, a wonderful thing to do with your time. Yeah, no, you're absolutely... It's, Go ahead. <laughs> it's not like when sometimes... One of the reasons I founded this group was I was going to concerts and I noticed how much people were coughing and, and fooling around with their little rappers. And I thought, my God, no one's listening to the music. And why? Why isn't anyone listening? It was so distracting, all the people in the audience making noise. I realize they're detached. They're not, they're, something isn't attaching them to it. And that's what we need. And I think the opera is doing that. You, you, you see the wave of interest in the opera and the way they market and everything. Well, the operas haven't changed. Maybe the stagings have, but it's still going to be, you know, the great operas. And of course, I love new operas too. Um, it's just that they're reaching out to people in a new way to come and see the old favorites. And those masterpieces are becoming more and more pop. I think opera is becoming the vehicle again for all classical music to then be known by people who would informally like classical music. Well, it, it, when they sit with the three tenors and then they go to the opera and then they hear instrumental music and they, then they find out Verdi had a requiem, it's one step after the next and you pull people over your bridges, as I said. Yeah. I hope you agree with me that it's not dead. Mm -hmm. No, no, I, no, I don't think it is either. And I think some of the, the reasons that, that Van Hohenacker points out that it is dead don't make any sense to me. He points out the record sales. Uh, and there are a number of things that are wrong with his, well, his description of dead. the record sales. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> records. If anything is dead in this conversation, it's record sales. Um, but uh, he, he, he says, well, it's only 3%, and it's, it's up from last year, but it's way down from the year before, and blah, blah, blah. And uh, Andy Doe points out that the reason it was really high in 2011 was that there were two really big crossover albums, and then it went back down to where it normally is, around 3% 
or so of the of the market normally. Uh, and by the way, if you're not reading Andy Doe's proper Discord blog, you should really reconsider a lot of things in your life because um, <laughs> it's it's brilliant. Um, but so the three percent thing is really strange a strange way to describe something as not being successful because we often see people talking about the thriving indie rock scene and how big of a percentage of the the record sales does that represent probably maybe a little more than three percent but i mean it's still we still call it the independent rock scene right so it's not well we may have to put classical music on the rock indie stations absolutely and if you have to see ourselves as a continuum not as something in an ivory tower yeah and that actually if you look at the the Grammy Awards, the Rock Awards weren't presented during the TV show. They were part of the same not on television award ceremony that the classical awards were in, yeah. right? What were you um, going to say, Sam? Well, it's interesting to point out that um, the one great analogy that he makes in, in the, on the uh, proper Discord blog is that Volkswagen, uh, oh I yeah, Vol- Volkswagen, Mercedes, and one other German company, whoever present, they represent a little less than 3% of auto sales in the United States. And nobody says that Mercedes and Volkswagen are dead, you know? <laughs> right. Um, it's I, also think worth- to, I think we have to fight for culture also. We have to make sure that people understand that we're creating something that makes life worth living. And I, who said that creating another cereal makes life worth living? I mean, yeah. who said that creating another bomb makes life worth living? We have to be politically active as well. I am wary of that intrinsic value argument because I don't think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a sell to anybody. Like you shouldn't support this just because it's the right thing to do, right? You well, should... I didn't say it's the right thing, it's the beautiful thing. Well, <laughs> it's beautiful. E- either way, if somebody doesn't see beauty in it, then they're not going to then that argument is not going to to hold for them. All yeah. people love music, and they love different forms of music. We have to, uh, but you know that classical music takes a little more exposure to be uh, be able to enter into its world, and so we. It's very important that people are exposed to it. Once they are exposed to it, they understand it. Well, and I last- to think that our way of exposing them is a door. It opens a door for many people to enter into the, the this world. One last takedown point that I'd like to mention in the Slate piece. Um, he says that uh, new classical music has as much chance of being commercially successful as pedophilia, which is just another example of how idiotically written the piece was. But it also says to me, what was the last like new classical piece this guy listened to, like the Roger Sessions Violin Concerto? Has he not listened to anything coming out of New Amsterdam Records? or like? There's lots of Grammy award winning New Amsterdam records, you mean? Yeah, Grammy <laughs> award winning. And speaking of the Grammys, great, Dave. See what I, I did mean, there? The, Boom. Yeah, a lot of the new music that's coming out in the classical area is not challenging in the same way some of the post World War II music would have been challenging. But there so. is still a lot of really good, really challenging music that could be just as valuable to and, and just as interesting to the, the right sort of people. I mean, one thing. That I think the the internet is allowing us to do through these new kinds of distribution that that Eve was talking about is that it lets these little things pop up everywhere. Uh, in uh, Chris Anderson's book, The Long Tail, he writes about um, that the idea that popular taste isn't intrinsically bad. It's not that everybody has bad taste. But the, the things about everyone's taste that we all have in common is probably bad. But everyone ha- does like really interesting and unique things that are good, but it's harder to make those things that appeal to everybody. And so we make the stupid things that appeal to everybody. And so our little thing can be good and effective and valuable and, 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 and a wonderful artistic statement, but only appeal to a handful of people and still be... Uh, a, a viable art form um, right. 
so I think I don't know if there's anything else that we can say about this. Maybe we should move on to the the Grammys that we've hinted at a couple of times now. Uh, yeah. Last Sunday after our show was the Grammy Award ceremony, and they announced all of the winners uh, of the uh, of the uh, non TV show awards in the afternoon, right as we were uh, finishing up the show. But uh, quick rundown of the classical award winners: Best Orchestral Performance went to Osmo Vanska and the Minnesota Bruce, Orchestra, who are finally back. And turmoil. So congratulations to Osmo and the Minnesota Orchestra. We don't know. Osmo is still resigned. There was some talk that he might, there might be some interest, mutual interest in him returning. We'll have to see how that goes. Uh, but congrats to them, uh, not just for the Grammy, but also, again, for, for being back from not playing. Uh, Sam, were you going to say anything? I just, like, through Tempest and Turmoil, they, they won the uh, Grammy. Speaking of Tempest. Yeah. The uh, best opera recording went to Thomas Otis's The Tempest, which is cool. New music, winning best opera recording. Mm-hmm. Go, go new music. Best choral performance is Arvo Pert. Uh, and I best Arvo Pert. Pert's great and another recent composer. Um, we have uh, best chamber music, uh, small ensemble performance was Roomful of Teeth, New Amsterdam winning a Grammy. So go, go New Am. Uh, and and go room full of teeth. That's that's very cool. That, that that's coming on the heels of uh, their recording of uh, Carolyn Shaw's Partita for Eight Voices, winning uh, the Pulitzer Prize. Um, so things are things are looking good for Shaw and Room Full of Teeth. And it's a it's a great recording if you haven't heard it. Uh, not just from us telling you to listen to it, but from everybody else in the world telling you to listen to it. Go do that because it's wonderful. Um, best classical instrumental solo, John Colliano, another living composer, uh, his uh, percussion concerto performed by Evelyn Glennie. I uh, thought, is there a recording out of that? I haven't heard it yet. Well, I, the Grammys award records, so yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> there you go. The one that won, I guess. There's, there's at least that the, one. Uh, the the uh, best classical vocal solo, this is interesting. Best classical vocal solo went to this collaboration. And I don't know if, I think we've talked about it on the show before. This collaboration between Don Upshaw and Maria Schneider. Uh, called Winter Morning Walks, and it's on Schneider's Artist Chair uh, label thing. And you can go to Artist Chair uh, on the web and buy it from them. Not wild about Artist Chair. Maria Schneider is super militant about digital things breaking, ruining everything about her universe. <laughs> and uh, so you can't stream it anywhere, which is dumb. So uh, I guess I'll never listen to it, Maria. Uh, best Classical <laughs> Compendium. Uh, is uh, the Hindemith, uh, Hindemith music, so not, not the most recent of composers, but still 20th century guy. Uh, and the uh, best contemporary classical con- uh, composition was that uh, Maria Schneider piece uh, with, with Don Upshaw's performance, and not, as I would have hoped, uh, Carolyn Shaw's Partita for Eight Voices. But, yeah, you know. It's, it's- it's all very hopeful, I think. Yeah, no, it's I great. have to sign off now. I, I, uh, oh. That's all right. I'm sorry. I have a student coming. But, <laughs> okay. Um, again, I just want to say thank you so much. Yeah. And I do hope everyone comes to Tchaikovsky, None But the Lonely Heart at BAM from March 5th to 9th. And let's be hopeful about the music scene. I think if all the creative artists call in, you're going to find out there's tremendous energy and positivity and idealism out there. And um, don't forget that in every era, as far as new music goes, for example, the time of Beethoven, there were 200 composers living in Vienna, and we only remember about two of them uh, at Beethoven's time, Beethoven and Haydn. I mean, and it'll be the same now. It's exciting to go and see what's new. You don't know what's great until you hear a lot of it, and it will emerge what's great on the new music scene and also in the experimentation uh, as what for what we're doing, you know, to see different ways of presenting music, pre-existing music. So I wish you all good luck, and um, I'd love to call in another time. Yeah, yeah. we'd love to have you back. Thank yeah, you. Uh, you thank you so other, much for joining any us. Other have, before I go, or say what? Any last question before I go? Well, I was curious about one thing. You guys, because it's such a hybrid kind of presentation format. Do you get reviewed by theater reviewers or music reviewers? Well, um, both. Okay. But no one knows where to put us exactly. I have to say. Which is a fantastic thing. Choose. Are we theater? Are we music? Um, yeah. We're a th- theatrical concert. We're a new form. 
A very Wagnerian yeah. of you. And you get like big name <laughs> actors too. You get big name actors. I was saying that Jeremy Irons started yeah, right. one of your. Uh, yes. We and had Jeremy Irons and his wife, Sinead Cusack, playing Chopin and George Sand. Nice. And, and, and kudos to you just to help bump up your credibility. Jeremy Irons has been cast as Alfred in the new Batman versus Superman. Oh, whoa. Movie. That was <laughs> no, we've, we've performed all over the world and been very lucky and performed. Um, I even did Toscanini. Um, in my heart, too much of the absolute at La Fenice in their small and very gilded theater at La Fenice in Venice, Italy. In Italian, we've done things in different languages, and um, we're we're having a great time here. So come come visit us and see us. And we'll um, have links to the to the upcoming show in the show notes, and I will uh, send April an email to let you know when everything is posted and ready to go. And and I would commend everyone to the to this to their site. They have a really beautiful site that has uh, some really great media on it. If you're if you've been listening or watching this and wondering what does this stuff look like. Uh, there you have a lot of great media on their site uh, to see what it is that we've been talking about all morning. So definitely go check those things out uh, when you get a chance. Thank you so much for joining Thank us this you morning, so Eve. much. I'd love to come back. Thanks a lot. Yeah. That was fun. Right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So definitely don't tase me, bro. Don't tase <laughs> Sam. And if you do tase Sam, do not <laughs> steal his Stradivarius violin. That's correct. So uh, Frank Almond, who is, is in addition to being uh, the concertmaster of the Milwaukee Symphony Orchestra, also writes a writes a great blog uh, at uh, doom, blanking on the name, but he writes a great blog. We'll have the link in the show notes. Sorry, sorry, Frank. Uh, but he was walking to his car with his violin this last week and had his violin stolen. Two people came up to him, tased him grabbed the violin, and sped off. Uh, in a minivan. In a minivan. So don't trust people that drive minivans. Um, <laughs> and uh, we haven't heard anything new from him since. There's, there, there's an investigation. A reward has been offered. So if you know anything, if anybody is trying to sell you a $6 million Stradivarius, uh, <laughs> maybe you should uh, turn them in and get the $100,000 reward. 100,000 bones. So... Now it, the thing is, the thing is, saying that it's worth six million dollars might entice someone who doesn't know anybody know any better into stealing it. But it's six million dollars in a li very limited market, wherein it would be virtually impossible to sell such a stolen item. Yeah, it's, it's art theft, like they were saying in the article. It's yeah. absolutely art theft, and just like it's impossible to sell a stolen, you know, Picasso, yeah. because everybody knows in the art world that there's a missing Picasso. You're not going to be able to sell your st unless you're selling it to somebody that's equally shady, who's not going to be willing to pay you very much for it. Right. So <laughs> I don't it's know. It's ridiculous. It's, Maybe it's, it's being held hostage. Could be. Maybe. I don't know. Not a very not very smart criminals, uh, but feel so bad yeah. for uh, for Frank. That's just terrible. Um. So hopefully, hopefully we need to spread the news that this is not a viable way to try and make money if you have a criminal mind because you can't sell that thing. No matter what, how many newspapers or whatever say it's worth $6 million, it's only worth $6 million to the people who, if they saw it, would go, oh, this is Frank's violin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Crime and violins is not the way to go. Oh. <laughs> We I, there was only a, there was only a, a matter of time before we got into the violins puns. I think that might be the show title: Crime and Violence. <laughs> so that's going to do it for this week's Sound Notion. No, no, it's not oh, going to no, do it's it. Not. Did I forget something? Last week we forgot to mention, and we almost just forgot again, that storied Italian conductor Claudio Abbato passed away two weeks ago now. Um. And we forgot to mention that. Longtime music director of the Chicago Symphony. Right. And uh, also this week, um, folk singer and I guess you would say, uh, you know, frontier uh, musicologist, um, Pete Seeger. Also Chevy truck hawker. Yeah. Passed away at 94. So he did not. Neither of the Claudio Abato was pretty old, too. So neither of those guys got ripped off as far as uh, leading a nice full life. Yeah. But two greats in the music world gone. So, 
that now way, that, way to bring us down we were all we were all <laughs> you know having a fun time making violin puns right anyway that's gonna do it for this week's sound notion uh if you like the show and you want to read more about any of the things that we talked about, you should head on over to our site, soundnotion.tv slash SN, and you can find links to all the things that we talked about. You'll also find a link to soundnotion.tv slash live, where you can go and watch the show. We do stream the show live every Sunday at 11 a.m. Eastern time, so you can go there and watch us live and participate in chat and tweet at us during the show if you want. You can tweet at us. We're at SoundNotion on Twitter. I'm at Dave McDowell. Sam is at Housegoy. Nate is at Anatri. Excuse me. Uh, ensemble for the Romantic Century is at at, on, at Romantic Century, um, and you can also suggest stories for the show using hashtag SN Weekly. You can also find us on Facebook, like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, do all those things that you do in the social media space um, to to connect with us. We'd love to have this conversation, not just about the uh, rather facile arguments made by Mark Van Honfelter uh, in in uh, Honacker. In, sorry. Mark Van Honacker in this past Slate uh, article that we've been talking about, but also all the other things that we spoke about uh, on, on the social media channels. So we'd love to do that. You can subscribe to this show and all our shows at soundnotion.tv in the iTunes store. So go ahead and do that. You can also find us on Slacker Radio if you're a Slacker Radio user. Um, you can support us. Uh, if you'd like to do that, by sharing the show with your friends, tell all your friends about how great the show is and how much they should subscribe to it to make their lives complete and worthwhile and meaningful. Um, and you can also use the Amazon search uh, box on our site, and we get a tiny little commission if you do that. It doesn't cost you anything, but we get a little kind of finder's fee for, for bringing you over to the Amazon store. Sound Notion's introduction includes music by Patrick Gulo and video by Tyler Lepp. Thank you again so much for watching or listening, and we will see you back next week. Don't tase me, bro.